Welcome to Hayes Memorial UMC Online. The purpose of Hayes Memorial UMC is valuing all people, discovering faith, and engaging community. If you'd like to know more about our church, please visit www.hayesmemorialumc.org. Oh uh-huh. 
our courage The bow to me, the peace we long to know Open up our Face to face, out on a limb. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was so short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone or anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, and today we start our new sermon series called Face to Face. We're over the next four weeks. Leading up to Advent, we will be looking at people who had life-changing encounters with Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. But we're not just going to listen to these stories. We're not just going to read them. We are going to intentionally seek to place ourselves within the story to hear what Jesus might also have to say to us through these encounters. We are going to seek to have our own life-changing encounter with Jesus through the gift of Scripture and the power of the Holy Spirit through this sermon series. Well, in 2013, the B&Q lines of the New York subway were shut down for two hours by two little kittens. The B&Q, if you're not aware, are the two main lines that run from Brooklyn into the heart of Manhattan. A two-hour disruption was going to cause problems no matter what time it was. The two kittens were spotted running down the tracks right next to the third rail, and that's the one that carries the power, 600 volts. So they made a decision. They decided to cut the power to the whole line, and for almost two hours, the commuters and subway officials waited while a few tried to rescue the flustered felines. Alas, the kittens managed to stay out of reach long enough. They were not in any danger anymore. And so they returned power to the rail and then started the local trains and eventually the express trains. But they issued an alert inviting the drivers to keep a lookout for the strays. Well, seven hours later, they rescued those two little kittens and named them Arthur and August. 
But as you can imagine, plenty of people had plenty to say about that two-hour delay. Some praising the administrators for their efforts of rescuing the kittens. Others questioning why they didn't uh, look longer for the kittens before they started the trains back up again. And of course, there were those that were upset about the two-hour delay itself. The commentary and the argument centered around one center question. One simple question. Were the kittens worth it? Were they worth it? Well, today we are invited to ask the same question about a guy who's out on a limb trying to see who is causing the commotion in his own neighborhood. We're talking about Zacchaeus. The first thing we learn about Zacchaeus is that he is the chief tax collector. And as a result of this, he's also very wealthy. To truly understand the story of Zacchaeus, we need to understand what tax collectors did. I want to invite you to listen to what this author says and how he describes the way taxes were collected in Jesus' time. The author writes, The method of tax collectors were unethical, to say the least. For one, these tax collectors would harass people wherever they could, and they would tax them on the spot. So even if a different tax collector shook you down from money up the road, you could be taxed again by another collector just hours or minutes later. Second, they would also place an inflated and fictitious value on property or income in order to get a higher percentage of tax. And third, they would give loans to people who couldn't pay their tax and then charge high interest rates on this private debt. And what options did the Jewish people have? Well, in short, they had none. These tax collectors were backed by the authority of the Roman Empire, the enemies, and they were occupied by Roman soldiers. Furthermore, even if a Jewish person wanted to appeal to a judge for unjust tax collecting, this was of no use because the judges were the direct beneficiaries by the revenue. In other words, even the judges themselves were bribed. Tax collectors in Jesus' time were hated and ostracized within the Jewish community because they were so unfair and because they were in cahoots with the enemies, the Romans. And Zacchaeus isn't just a tax collector. He's the chief tax collector. He's the guy who not only shows up at your door and takes everything you've got, but he shows up with muscle Roman muscle. But he's also the guy some historians think recruited all the other guys in the area that also collect taxes. To say the least, for many in the crowd that day as Jesus comes through town, for many, Zacchaeus wasn't worth it. He wasn't worth their time. He wasn't worth having a relationship with. He was someone to uh, ignore. He was someone to keep away from. He was someone to ostracize. And in fact, more than that, to them, he was worthless. He was hated. He was despised. And this is why Jesus' acknowledgement of him and desire to stay with him at his house was so unpopular. Remember, they grumbled against Jesus and they said, has he really gone to be the guest of a sinner? Because Jesus' invitation was more than just to spend time with Zacchaeus. It was more than just an invitation to stay with Zacchaeus. And Jesus' invitation to Zacchaeus, surrounded by all these people who have probably been victims of Zacchaeus, Jesus' invitation was an invitation of friendship. We are invited to see ourselves in the crowd this morning. We are invited to ask ourselves, are there people who we have decided are not worth it? <clears throat> people we have decided that may not be worth our time or worth having a relationship with. Are, are there people we would rather not invite to our homes 
and people we would like to keep away from our homes or from theirs. And this is why I think God repeats over and over and over in scripture for the Israelites to welcome the stranger. Because the stranger I have the hardest time welcoming isn't the one I don't know, but the one I don't want to know. The people whose lifestyles, whose values, whose tradition, whose culture and worldview is different from my own and perhaps even challenges my own. In the book, Blue Light Jazz by Donald Miller, another book I would encourage you to read if you haven't, Donald talks about being at an alumni social event where communications professor Greg Spencer was talking about the power of metaphor. Now, at one point, he invited everyone to consider where our, our use of metaphors can cause problems in the way that we talk and speak. He asked them to consider the way we talk about relationships. And so people said, well, we invest in people. We value people. A relationship can be bankrupt. People can be considered priceless. The thing that the professor pointed out is all those terms are economic metaphors. It was at that moment that Donald realized what had bothered him so much about the church for so many years. He writes, and that's when it hit me like so much epiphany getting dislodged from my arteries. The problem with Christian culture is we think of love as a commodity. We use it like money. Professor Spencer was right. And not only was he right, I felt as though he had cured me, as though he had let me out of my cage. I could see it very clearly. If someone is doing something for us, offering us something, be it gifts, time, popularity, or what have you, we feel they have value. We feel they are worth something to us, and perhaps we feel they are priceless. I could see it so clearly and I could feel it in the pages of my life. This was the thing that smelled so rotten to me all these years. I used love like money. The church used love like money. With love, we withheld affirmation from the people who did not agree with us, but we lavishly financed the ones who did. I wonder how many of us could testify to the fact that we also have used love as a commodity. Love was never meant to be bartered with or withheld. Love, in the way that God designed it, was meant to be a free gift that God lavishes on us and we should lavish on others, regardless of what they can do for us or what they've done to us or whether or not we agree with them. You see, Zacchaeus wasn't the only one that went out on a limb that day. Jesus went out on a limb for Zacchaeus, risking his own popularity, risking losing some of his followers, risking his reputation by associating with, no befriending a man everyone else despised. And since Jesus got political first by inviting himself to a known tax collector's home, I think that gives me a little room to get political too. In a time in which we are seeing great political divisiveness, I wonder what it would look like for Christians to invite themselves across the aisle of the other. To build bridges, not walls, with those we disagree with. And here's the thing. Here's what Jesus knew. No one is going to listen to you if they feel as if you don't like them. As a mentor once said it to me, no one cares about how much you know till they know how much you care. And that is really the main difference between Jesus and the crowd that day. Jesus freely offers Zacchaeus friendship and love. Jesus really likes Zacchaeus, not for what he's done, but for who he is. In fact, 
Jesus has every reason to dislike him, just like the rest of the crowd. But Jesus refuses to use love like a commodity, like money. Jesus instead offers friendship and love freely to Zacchaeus. And this free gift of love changes the cold, calloused heart of Zacchaeus. Surely we too are like Zacchaeus, not just like the crowd. Surely we have places in our own lives that we are calloused and cold. Surely we have places in our own lives that we need the healing touch of God's unconditional love for us. The places in our own hearts where we lack generosity, where we withhold from others, where we use deception to get what we want. Just like Zacchaeus, Jesus looks at us, risking his own reputation, and says, hurry, hurry. Today I must stay with you. Jesus does not push us away but draws close to us, even in our brokenness. Zacchaeus was worth it. And you are worth it. And others are worth it. And that's why Jesus reminds the crowd of something they had forgotten about Zacchaeus, and maybe even forgotten about themselves. And I believe it is something that we too forget when we find ourselves at odds with others. Jesus says to the crowd, today salvation has come to this house because Zacchaeus too is a son of Abraham. I want to use an illustration to highlight what I think Jesus is saying to us to Zacchaeus and to the crowd that day by saying these words, that Zacchaeus is also a son of Abraham. How many of you know what this is? It's a dollar, right? And this one's actually pretty clean. It's pretty crisp. I mean, it's got a little bit of fading on it, but by and large, this looks like a pretty nice dollar bill. How much is this dollar bill worth? Well, hopefully you said one dollar, right? Okay. Now, how many of you know what this is? It's also a dollar bill, isn't it? But it's not as clean, it's not as crisp, it's a little bit more faded, it's wrinkled, um, it's a little dirtier. Uh, doesn't look as nice and crisp as the other one, does it? But let me ask you this. Let me ask you. Did its worth change because of its appearance? What's the difference between this and this? Did its worth change because of its brokenness? Does its worth depreciate because it doesn't look as clean and crisp as this one? Well, the answer is no. Because it's not. It's not the appearance that determines the worth of this dollar bill. What determines the worth of this dollar bill is the image that's on it. In fact, I've seen much worse dollar bills than this one, and I've actually been able to use them and spend them. And that's the reality. It's the image, the image that determines its worth. And what I'm trying to say to you is this. When Jesus calls Zacchaeus the son of Abraham, Jesus is reminding everyone that regardless of what Zacchaeus has done, He still bears the image of God, and so do you. Zacchaeus is still worth it because of the image he bears. And here's the reality that we must remember. 
the stranger, the people we don't know and those we don't want to know bear the image of God and so they are worth it. Our neighbor, whether we know who they are or we don't know who they are, are worth it. And even our enemy, the ones we find ourselves at odd with, the ones that we dislike, the ones that we want to stay away from or push away from us are worth it. So the question for us to wrestle with this morning is are we being changed by God's love to love like Jesus? To offer friendship and love within our community, not just the people we sit with on Sunday morning, not just the people we know, not just our family members, but are we willing to love like Jesus? And may I encourage you this week to go out on a limb, to love others the way that Jesus loves you, the way that Jesus loves Zacchaeus, because people are worth it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We hope that you found this service encouraging and nourishing to your faith as you seek to grow closer to God and to become like Christ through following him. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so in three different ways. In person, by mail, or online at www.hayesmemorialumc.org. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and click the donate button. Please prepare your heart for a blessing. Go in the love of God, in the grace of Jesus Christ, his son, in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to be disciples to make disciples, and to know that you are loved.